Hey guys, it's Ronnie Doss and it's Jen. Hey Jen. <laughs> hey. Hope you guys are having a terrific day today. We are. Got up and got started early and so we wanted to spend a little time with you. Uh, I wanted to talk about three things today. Uh, basically addressing some of what the challenges are that, that we're facing as really a planet. Some of the things that are going on with us as a people. And uh, I want to discuss today, I want to talk about commitment, I want to talk about courage, uh, and I want to talk about covenant. Those three things, those are three very powerful words, and I think sometimes we hear those words and we can um, toss them around, but I wanted to kind of drill down on some of those and make sure that I'm sharing with you some things that I've learned in my studies and working with as many people as I get to work with across the country and around the world with teams and individuals. And so. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you, but I'm most excited about having this lady right here with me. So She's so pretty. Momentous occasion. It's very <laughs> momentous. Today is the day. So, uh, happy Saturday. It's going to be a good day. So, uh, I want to share with you a couple of things from, I study a lot of coaches, people that are very, very successful. John Wooden, Pat Riley, uh, Phil Jackson, guys that in from the professional basketball uh, arena who just have led great teams. John Wooden led UCLA's Bruins for years, many national championships. And I learned a lot from him and what people would say about him that played for him and really the fundamentals of what he shared with them that made them so much better, not just on the basketball court, but also just in life in general. And when I work with teams, that's one of the big things that I'm always trying to do is I'm trying to encourage people there in the workplace with their team, doing what it is that they do. But I'm also sharing principles with them that are hopefully going to transcend just being in the workplace, but going home and building better relationships with their family and doing the things that I think are most important. Uh, we talk a lot about, and it's a phrase that I share all the time, is that if you win in the marketplace, but you fail at home, that's still a failure. And I think in our culture, in our society, it seems so, it, it's so prevalent that people think that if you make lots of money and you're doing good in business, then that means you've got it all figured out. And what I have learned is that's not the case. Now that's part of it. It tells part of the story when you're making income or you're, you're doing well in business or you've got a job where you're getting promoted. That tells part of the story, but by no means does it tell the whole story. And so for us, one of the things that we've always done is we've always made sure that our relationship was working, that she always knew that I was right, um, and that... What? Anyway, that I had it figured out, right? No, but, but it's important and for us to win at home. And so we have children, that's important. Our family is so important. And so we have, we have a lot of fun and we make sure that we're keeping the main things the main thing. Now, with everything that's going on with COVID-19 and the coronavirus, um, a lot of people are having to stay at home and do things that a lot of times I don't think they would normally do and as a result, it's bringing a lot of things to the surface and they're experiencing things within them that they thought maybe were handled or maybe that weren't there anymore. And one of the things that we, we talk a lot about is an idea that pressure provokes programming. And so programming can be belief systems and mindsets that you have that maybe you don't even know where you got them. Maybe you got them from watching your parents. Maybe you got them from going through certain situations and scenarios of dealing with people on your job or when you were in school. Um, and really the, the narrative or the dialogue that you made up as a result of dealing with those situations. And so we start to develop these truths about ourselves and who it is that we think we are. And many times they're just not accurate. Like you can make up stories about yourself from a very early age and it just, it's not true. But because it was your first thought, we tend to carry that with us for so long in our life and we tend to defend that belief in the beginning and um, that can be a real challenge for us. And so today I wanted to talk about just a few of these things and share with you some insights that, that have really helped me and helped us to really create success, but not just on the outside with our business, but also be successful at home. So anyway, you have anything you want to say before yeah, I... Just no, because once he gets going, you know if you've seen him go, he goes for a little while. But I just wanted to say first that if you do have any questions, you can, um, I'm, I can see your questions here. We can see them coming up. 
And we just got one from our friend Steve. So mm -hmm. we'll we'll see that. But if you do have questions that come up while he's talking or saying something, please feel free to put it in. Or if you have an anonymous question, you can email and I can look at our email and you can um, send that to info at dosteam.com. And if that's something that yep. you... In you want us to answer anonymously. Yeah, cool. Info, I-N-F-O at dosteam.com. Mm -hmm. So what beliefs will be developed because of COVID? Um, I think one thing many people are, uh, a, not a, I don't know if it's a belief yet, Steve, that people have developed, but I think that it's on the forefront and there's a possibility, is that people feel like that no matter what they do, their life is out of control. And so that, you know, one day, what's the point of working really hard to build a business? like many people have. Think about all the small businesses of, uh, that are struggling right now. It's Many people can develop this idea of what's the point anyway. If I put in all this time and I work really hard, um, can, you know, and then something changes with the economy overnight, then you know, wh why should I even work? Why should I even give my best to it? And uh, hey, Michael Hamburger, what's up, buddy? Um, but why should I work at that? Well, that, that's almost the same mindset of why should I work at my marriage? Why should I try to get better in marriage knowing that my spouse could just wake up one day and leave, that they could pack up everything and, and, and head out? And that's a belief that I think keeps us in a place of fear more on the defensive versus being really on the offensive saying, what can I do today to make tomorrow better? And so there's a few quotes in here actually um, that I wanted to share with you uh, regarding that. Actually, it's a great question. Um, and it, it, Jordan Peterson, he's, he's a phenomenal book, phenomenal author, he said, what saves us is not what we know. He said, what saves us is the willingness to learn from what we do not know. And ultimately, that's an openness to what could go on in the future and really just choosing to be on the offensive every day, moving towards a future that we haven't yet designed. And the future shows up based upon what I believe the investments we're willing to make today in our relationship, in our physical health, uh, financially, with business, in our job, if we want to get promoted, if we want things in the future to go better, we've gotta be willing to do the work today. And so one of the things that I think is happening with people is this came on so quickly, Steve, that COVID-19 showed up, and we say quickly, there are people that can argue that, and I don't get into those arguments, that we knew months out, maybe we did, but at this point, you just don't know who to believe. So I'm gonna to choose to believe um, what has worked best for me, which is to do the work on myself and for my family. But this happened so quickly that I think it came in from left field that it shocked people. It, it knocked people out. It was like, man, we didn't see this coming. One day, the president, I remember a few months ago, he's doing the State of the Union address. Unemployment is at an uh, all-time low. Uh, the economy's doing well. People are happy, seem to be happy doing well. And then boom, all, this sudden, all of a sudden this virus comes out and people are on shutdown mode. People are afraid to go out to the store. They're raiding toilet paper off of the, the shelves, which that just show you really what the mindset that we have sometimes when fear takes over. And how a person responds to this is really an, an indication of, of some of their programming and the belief systems that they have about the world. And so with all this happening, I'm afraid, not afraid, I'm, I don't live in fear, but I'm aware that many people could say, I worked really hard to build something and then overnight it got taken from me, swept out, the rug pulled out from under me, so what's the point in, in working anymore? And for me, I think as leaders and being people that wanna make a difference in the future regardless, I think we have to realize that regardless of what it may look like on the forefront in the future, we've got to be willing to ch choose in and commit to doing the work today because you never know what tomorrow is going to look like. That's, that's the biggest thing. Even Jesus said that. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough problems of its own. You do what you can do right now with the best that you can and tomorrow will take care of itself. And if you get in the habit of doing the best with what you have, then you construct or you build and you make space for tomorrow to be better. And you walk into a future that you in some way have contributed to today. And I, don't, I just think we don't want to forget that. And I think that's one of the problems that we may face is people are just discouraged going, I worked really hard, and then it's, it, it's just not here anymore. And people do that in marriages. You know, I've done trainings a lot of, around the world with a lot of people. And there have been people who said, hey, I gave 20 years to a marriage 30 years to a marriage and my spouse left 
and they're disheartened and they're discouraged. But the conversation is not who was wrong or who was right. The conversation is what could I do differently moving forward that will prevent that from happening again? And it may happen again. Um, but what can I do right now that, that, uh, that really helps me to become more skilled at developing better relationships and having stronger relationships? And so uh, I'm not going to be kind of on the defensive there. Um, Peter Burt said, what did, what did he say? Nothing is being taken from us. I believe this is an opportunity to go back to the core basics and build something. That's what we were talking about last night. Like what priorities now people are hopefully going to set as far as like a boundary is what was keeping us so busy mm -hmm. then and now we have no choice but to slow down. So everybody taking a good hard look at what, you know, real priorities we could put together and go, this is from now on, I'm making this a priority, spending more time with my family, not being out buzzing around all the time, which is one thing that I did really well, you know, just buzzing back and forth just because I'm, I'm busy and I'm a mom and that's what we do. But yeah. we obviously don't need that. So priorities, I think, changing. Yeah, I mean, think about this, guys, when, when how easy it is that when this is lifted, this is one of the things that I would hope that maybe you would think about for you is that we go from awareness to an agreement. And, and my, my good friend Steve Murray, uh, who I was, he actually just sent that question over a minute ago, um, we were talking about making agreements and how agreements protect us sometimes from ourselves. And agreements can protect in a, in a relationship. And so uh, in, in talking about that yesterday, I was, I was talking to Jen. It's like when we're developing all this awareness during this time when we're at home, and where we, we can't, I say can't, we're, we're not supposed to be going out and doing all these things. And at that time, we start to become aware of what things really matter most. And hey, Dr. Jake, what's up, buddy? And th th we become aware of what matters most. And so in that moment or those moments or hours or days of uh, awareness, when you have that heightened sense of awareness, that's a great time to sit down with your spouse, even sit down by yourself and say, this is an agreement that I'm going to make with myself moving forward, or this is an agreement that we're going to make moving forward so that we stay anchored to the awareness that we gained during that time of COVID-19 and, and all that went down when we were quarantined or, or sheltering in place. All the things that we learned doing that, we're not going to throw that away as soon as we go back out into busy land. Because what's going to happen is they're going to lift some of this stuff. And yes, it's, it will be in phases for us. But when those gates open, you know what's going to happen? Hey, your mom's hey, on. Hey, mom. Hey, Mima. <laughs> it's Mima. Um, but when, when those gates open and we flood back out into doing you know normal life like we used to, it's so easy for us to forget what things we learned. And it's like, oh, man, we learned that family time is so valuable and that we need to be sitting and having a meal with one another and we need to make sure that we're communicating well and that, you know, uh, we're like going to the grocery store. It's like you got to manage your time. You want to make a list, block off everything you need so you can make one trip and get it so that we're not in the grocery store every single day doing 20 minute trips, which can consume so much time. Who are you talking it, to? Not about, I don't know. I, I heard somebody, somebody emailed me that one time. I have no idea who we, but it's that kind of awareness that you go, you know, it might be better for us, right? Come yeah. on. I mean, it might be better for us to make this type of an agreement and say, hey, this is what we're going to do, or this is what we're not going to do. And that way, when this is over and we have gone through it, we can say that we also have grown through it that we matured, that we got better, that we refined, we enhanced, and now we live from a different place than how we lived before we went into this challenge that we faced. And make no mistake about it, this is and has been a challenge for many people, but um, one of the quotes that I have shared a lot is Norman Vincent Peale, and he said that every challenge has within it the seeds of its own solution. So if you have no problems or challenges, as he said, you have no seeds. And so we have seeds that have been dumped in our lap. Like here they are, here's a bunch of seeds. Now you can take those seeds and you can toss them over your shoulder, looking at the glory days and how it used to be. Hi, Tina Murray. Um, 
Cameron's coming to hang with us soon. Um, but you can take those seeds and throw them over your shoulder thinking this is how good it used to be. Or you can take the seeds and go, hey, we're going to throw them forward, mm -hmm. sow them into the future, and, and you know, do what's necessary with those seeds. That, that is where you, your future has better results in it than always looking back at your past, talking about, well, back, in, back then it used to be so good. Well, we can't do that because it does us no good to look over our shoulder and say, well, this is how good it used to be. Because they, there's an old saying that says, glory days lead to mediocre days. And you, you've got to be careful that you're not always thinking about how good it used to be. We've got to be doing this work, and that's some of what I want to talk about here in some of my notes. We've got to be doing that work to sow the seeds forward that we gain from some of these challenges so our future can be better. And so, hey, Dan Johnston, Dr. Jan, Dan, like stud. What's up, man? <laughs> hey, but that's, that's what's so important, I think. So um, just keeping that in mind. Um, do you have anything you want? Did somebody come in here? Do we have somebody I think else in there? Someone snuck in. Somebody snuck in. You Our little hi. Kennedy's here. You want to say hi? Come here. Hey, come up and say hi really quick. No. no. Um, so that's that's the I'm part sure. of this today. So do you have anything you want to add to that, ma'am? She's doing mommy so. mommy stuff because that's what double we do. Uh, job here. Yes. Okay. You want to say hi? hi? Come say hi. Everybody wants to it's see Kennedy. It's the family thing this anyway, is Kennedy. right? Say hi. Look up here, Kennedy. Look up to this. And wave. Thing. Say hi. <laughs> Um, so this is Kennedy, our six-year-old, who is amazing. So um, anything you wanted to add to that as far as, you know, looking over the, our shoulder or or. The, I mean, I think that just of... applies to now or any time, but more now than ever. And it's easy for us to say that. You know, it's easy for us to go, don't look over your shoulder, don't look back, nothing's back there, only look forward. But right now, it's what I think just where we're going to put our priorities and where we're going to look. Yeah. From now on, because this is something that we've never had to deal with yeah. in can, our lifetimes. Yes, and speaking of never had to deal with, can I say something? Can sure. I, please? Can you? This is this is my own haircut doing. Kyle. Kyle is, is on. Is Kyle watching. Is, Kyle. Kyle's on here. Oh, Kyle, Kyle used to cut my hair in Nashville, and she did such a good <laughs> job. And well, obviously, I do a better job. <laughs> this is this is what happens, guys, when you. Come on, and, Kyle, but this side like, maybe not as bad. But happy morning. So let's let's talk about that. Anyway, it looks good, doesn't it? It does. It looks good. It I does. think we've done it. So um, here's here's a couple of things we've not faced. This it's very easy to go into fear. I said I, I like uh, you are a pro. Kyle is on there. <laughs> I know, That's I'm it. Sorry. Um, it's, <laughs> you're a pro. So um, some of the coaches that I said I like to listen to with me, if you guys don't know this, like I coach, I think it's about 50 different teams around the country. And so we do all this virtually. We do, thank you, Steve. We do this virtually working with a lot of teams. And if you'd like some information on working with us at all or having me talk to you one-on-one -on, -one on the phone or virtually with your team, we do it all the time. You can email us, info at dosteam.com. But the, the, one of the coaches, uh, Pat Riley, uh, phenomenal coach at the NBA, he said, to be afraid is okay. He said, as long as you are afraid with dignity, which means, you know, it's all right to feel the fear, but you want to make sure as a leader and as someone who is leading in your own life, and sometimes people think, um, sometimes people think that, you know, leading means that you have to be out front and you've got to have lots and lots of people following you. And every time you make a move, people are going, yay, you're our leader. That is not to me what leadership means. I learned years ago that leadership was simply stepping up every day, stepping into courage and being willing to do the things that maybe you were scared to death to do anyway. And I was talking to my great friend, um, Kevin Goff here, and we, he called me yesterday and, and just such a phenomenal guy. He's been such an anchor in my life, as Steve Murray's on here, as same, just great guys. I'll tell you, if you want to do well in life, have awesome people around you. Um, but uh, Kevin and I were talking about what courage is, and it's the old quote of uh, courage is, is being willing to be scared to death and still saddle up and ride out and do the work anyway. John Wayne, and right? It's, it was a John, John Wayne, Wayne quote. Yeah. It's Ron Wayne. Oh. I made that. It's Ronnie Wayne. It's Ron Wayne. Um, but, you know, that's it. It's, it's even if you're afraid that you say, hey, I'm going to operate with, with courage here. I'm going to do it with dignity. And that is that, listen to me, no matter what you face, you still stand for the values that you've decided to bring into your life. And that is where when I had uh, my mentor, Mr. Clemmer, who I worked for, 
for many years, uh, he talked about samurai warriors. And that he, he, he was all about the samurai warrior. And as he talked about the samurai warrior, he said the reason samurai warriors were so, uh, so powerful and the reason that they were so successful when it came to battle is that the samurai warrior would go into battle as if they were already dead and that they weren't so attached to life and what they saw. They were really focused on the job that they knew that they had to do. And so with Pat Riley saying, hey, it's all right to be afraid, but you gotta be afraid with dignity. This is where we say, hey, we've never faced this ever before, ever, but guess what? We're gonna step in and we're gonna give our best anyway. And one of the, our, my Mima, who was just on, uh, Jen's mom, uh, her husband, uh, we call him Papa Dave. And Papa Dave is a first responder uh, in Georgia, and they just had those tornadoes that went through a few nights ago. And one of the things, we were talking the next day, and I was just listening to him talk, and I, I realized just how much courage some people have. And for where I'm like, man, I gotta step up my courage as well, we all can. Uh, but Papa Dave, we call him first responder, he goes out and after the storms, and he, he, he's searching and looking for people and, and all these different things. and. You know, I, I, he said the next day when they had the shelter set up for people to come and, and donate some goods and so forth, that a lot of the people that were donating goods and giving to these people that had lost everything the day before, the night before, lost their houses and lost possessions, even people lost lives, that the people that were lined up to contribute and to give were not people that were uber wealthy. These were people that many of them had lost things as well, but were showing up and contributing and giving. And I thought to myself, man, that's amazing. And he even said, Papa Dave said to me, he said, you know, it's amazing how people come together during difficult times. And I think that this situation we're in right now is another opportunity for us when we see that there's somebody that's in need, that's struggling with something, that we can step up and contribute and give to them and do something for them. And, and please hear me, doing something for somebody does not necessarily mean that you have to pack up a huge box and ship it UPS to them. Um, yes, you can do that. You can donate money. You can buy gift cards. You can do whatever that is. But one of the biggest things that you can do is, Mima said that's my man. That's, my man. <laughs> Mima, that's right, your man. But one of the biggest things that you can do is you can pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, checking in. I've got my friends, two of my closest friends, uh, Dr. Jeremy Hess and, and Dr. Sam Stewart, who I hiked the Appalachian Trail with, uh, we're on a text thread together and we're always texting and encouraging and just making each other laugh and we give each other a hard time and, and all that, but you know, that's what we do. But there's a camaraderie there. And you know, Pat Riley talked about, and, and I kind of say this, Pat Riley, who I just quoted uh, with dignity, he said that, that covenants are created during a crisis. And a lot of times what happens is we go through a crisis and we then forge a covenant of, hey, we're going through a lot right now and this is difficult. But during the, the season of walking through what would be a crisis, that's where trust is built. And Jen and I have been through, not a crisis, but we've been through some difficult times. Um, years ago, I, I had an accident. I broke my hands. I lost my stepfather uh, right after that. It, it was it was rough for my whole family. And when my stepfather died, John, it was it was horrible. I've got casts on both my arms. I can't really do much. And um, she and I, we, we weren't even married yet. Yeah. And so we, that was like a lot to go through when you're dating. But man, we navigated that. And I think she found out how amazing I am during that time. And a career change also. And a career change. And she and found out how amazing I was during that time. I think that's pretty much what yeah. you learned during that time. The only thing I learned. That's the only <laughs> thing she learned or knew is how, no, but you go through a crisis that forges a covenant, and I think covenant is huge, and that is where you, you make a covenant with the people closest to you, but you also make a covenant with people that uh, in your family you're closest to, but then a covenant with yourself that, hey, this is what I'm going to stand for. No matter how difficult this gets, no matter how challenging it may get, and how the circumstances are um, you know, out there, um, we're going to stand for covenant. What are you doing? I'm just, I'm getting to right there. So oh, if somebody see. sends an email. Okay, on. got it. Yeah. So, um, covenant. Let me give you a couple things on covenant. Does that make sense? Like, I hope you guys understand that covenant is a huge thing that you say, this is what I stand for no matter what circumstances might change. Um, covenant, 
Um, here's where I think what covenant is. Covenant is where I say, as a leader, I take full responsibility for myself and full accountability for my actions. And so I make that covenant that I'm going to take full responsibility for how I act and full responsibility or full accountability for my actions. Uh, Steve Murray says, I'm sorry picturing you two with cast on your hands is cracking me up. Thank you, Steve. Thank you <laughs> so much for that. Show. It was quite the show. Uh, Jen got me a Superman t-shirt. My it arms like were this. like this, just so you guys know. When, when I broke both my arms, it was, it was awful, guys. It, um, they put plates in my arms, and I had casts from like my fingertips up to my shoulders. And so I literally walked around like this. And so Jen got me a Superman t-shirt. A Superman t-shirt. <laughs> And I would walk around, and, and some guy asked me one time, he saw my cast and my Superman t-shirt, and he said, did you fly into a kryptonite wall? I was like, no, I didn't fly into a kryptonite wall. He's like, oh, okay. I guess he thought that was funny. It and then funny. I, then I hit him, I punched him with one of my cast hands. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Um, but, uh, you know, the covenant part of it is huge. And so covenant is where we say, hey, look, no matter what we go through, we're going we're gonna to deal with the fear with dignity, like Pat Riley said, which I just love that, guys. I think that's very um, appropriate. Uh, the second part of it, we said, we said covenant. The second thing we talk about is commitment. Uh, commitment is, is there's, there's some rules to commitment that I have always stood by. And one of the things that I always say is when the commitment is clear, the way will appear. And that is when I get committed to something, the circumstances will start to align for me that can help me to produce what it is that I say I'm committed to. And so, obviously, my wife and daughter are committed to leaving. I guess this was just too good. Is this too good for you guys? It's too much great information. I love powwow. I love powwow. I love you. But uh, when you stay committed to something, commitment uh, is where you, you dig in and you stay aligned with something and then you start to see the circumstances on the outside lining up to a commitment that you made uh, before you saw everything. And so someone once said that faith is being willing to see what you can't see before you believed. And so when I stand in faith, then I am projecting forward, believing I'm going to see something. And I stand for that and I believe that before right? I even see it on the, the outside. So faith is something you see with your mind and with your heart and with your imagination before the circumstances line up. And so what I've learned from commitment, guys, is that when I get committed, that commitment doesn't have anything to do with outside circumstances. That commitment has everything to do with what it is that I'm going to choose to stand for um, as I move forward in my life. And there's an old quote that what you do today determines what you get to do tomorrow. And so the commitment I'm willing to stand for during what we would say is a crisis or a challenge is going to create the space in the future where I can do other things, right? Uh, someone once said, what you say no to today determines what you get to say yes to tomorrow. What you say yes to today might determine what you say no to tomorrow. This all has to do uh, with commitment. And then uh, here's the third thing that I'll give you, and then we can be done. I don't know if my wife is going to come back. Hi, Hannah. I totally agree also. Um, thank you for that. Um, here's the third thing. I want to talk to you really quickly about courage. Courage. And we touched on it a little earlier, but this is the thing that is so required for navigating difficult times like this. Um, courage is where you find a way to stir up within you the best parts of you even when everything around you looks very unfamiliar and there is a negative narrative internal dialogue that may be going on within you causing you to feel overwhelmed causing you to feel scared to death causing you to feel like you don't have what it takes that you can't follow through and that you can't do it and so with that courage this is let me give you a couple things to help you with courage number one when you're feeling overwhelmed and anxious and you're having a lot of anxiety, how I was taught was that overwhelm always comes when you place yourself in your mind outside of where it is that you presently are. And so I'm going to keep my hand away over there. But if I, pro I project myself forward thinking, oh my goodness, I have to get this done and that has to be done and we got to do these things over here. I'm projecting myself outside of where I am and I'm not present and I'm not looking at what I am creating internally. What I'm doing is I'm focusing on things that I cannot control. 
And so one of the things that I always talk to teams about, especially like a high level leader who's really got a lot of pressure on them, they make a lot of big decisions, the, the, the decisions they make, they affect a lot of people. You know, one of the things that I always tell them is that you've got to get focused on what it is that causes you to be anchored and present in the moment so you can make a better decision moving forward. If you allow the outside circumstances to pull your strings always, you will wind up feeling like you are a puppet and you are out of control. And one of the things that, that I know very clearly is that you must learn to control the controllables. And the only thing that I have learned that you and I can control is what we are focused on inside, what our perspective is. The only thing we can control is where we put our mind. And if you can learn to control that, you win that small battle of focus. Over time, you wind up winning the war. And there is a war going on for your mind. There is a war going on for your spirit. There's a war going on for your marriage. There's a war going on for your peace. But let me tell you, there are a lot of battles that have to be fought on the road to peace. And one of the biggest battles you'll ever fight is for the, the battle of your focus. And so the moment you start feeling overwhelmed or anxious, you can simply ask yourself, what am I focused on right now that's fueling this feeling? What am I focused on? Not good, bad, right, wrong, not judging yourself. What am I focused on? And so if I ask myself what I'm focused on, and I say, well, this is what I'm focused on, and being focused on that is causing me to have this chemical release in my brain, right, that's fueling this overwhelm, then I must, I must shift my focus. Because if I'm focused on the thing that's causing me so much fear, then I'm going to be in fear mode. I'm going to be in reaction mode. I'm not going to be in creation mode. So I must immediately say, what am I focused on? Oh, I'm, focusing on, I'm focused on my bills right now, and, and I'm struggling, worried about paying my bills. Being focused on your bills is not going to fuel you and cause you to feel better. And so you immediately shift to something. Because here's one of the quotes that, that I came up with this past year, and I believe it's very true. Emotion follows focus and focus is always a choice. Emotion follows focus, and focus is always a choice. So what does that tell us about emotion? Well, emotion is a choice. Now, some people do that, and they're like, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not a choice. Well, naturally, there may be knee-jerk emotions that kick in. Thankfully, we have fight or flight, self-preservation mechanisms built into us, adrenaline kicks so that we could save ourselves if we need to, that we could fight something if we needed to fight to defend ourselves. There are knee-jerk emotions. However, for a majority of the time, hi Deb, a majority of the time, the chemicals that are being kicked off in our brain are simply based on what we are focusing on and what I focus on is a choice. Right now, I can focus on this and be totally engaged into this. That's going to release certain chemicals that are going to have me dialed into this. But the moment the doorbell were to ring and I put my focus on the doorbell and I go to the front door and I focus on that, now I'm going to feel completely different. So what does that tell me? That tells me that my state of being and what I feel and what I'm experiencing has a lot to simply do with what I allow myself to look at. This is why we don't do the news in our home. We don't sit around watching the media. I believe the media, I, I love the media for the good things. I think that, you know, the information that's out there. But I despise the sensationalism. I despise the pitting against one another. You got people that think they're, well, I'm Republican. So that means hate the Democrat. Or I'm a Democrat, hate the Republican. Or I'm for this, I'm, I'm libertarian. Or I'm whatever. And, and there's, it's so divisive. And, and you can watch different networks and you start going, yeah, they're right. Yeah, we should not like them. And what happens is we're so divided based on what we're being told. And it's amazing that your television tells you how to think, act, feel, what to wear, where to go, what you need to do. And I'm not saying that it's not good at, to a point, but if you stay focused on that, the chemical release that your brain will have will kick these cocktails off into your bloodstream. You're going to feel a certain way and you're going to behave based on how you feel. And the problem with that, I'm saying too much, the problem yeah. with that is that your kids pay for it. So if I watch the news and I'm focused on something that causes me to be really afraid and really mad at the world and angry, this little person over here picks up on that energy because more is caught than taught. So as, as a leader, I say, if I'm going to lead my home well, then guess what I get to do? I stand guard at the gate at what comes in. 
And one of the analogies that I heard was the television is like an animal who has fangs and its fangs are dripping with venom and it is waiting to inject you. And so that's the, that's the thing. And so, you know, you've got to be careful with that. And so where you put your focus. Um, with that, let me, let me give you this. When you focus on something and you see that you're receiving a natural chemical kick from what you're focusing on, if you have to focus on that, like if there's something that you see in your marriage that, that you're like needing to work on it, but you're feeling all these different chemicals, one of the things you can ask yourself is, what am I making this mean? This is called fact meaning. My friend Steve Murray loves this conversation. We've had this conversation so many times. My mentor, Mr. Clemmer, taught me about this for the first time. We were actually out to eat one time, and he explained it to me. We had gone to, to dinner. I was traveling with him, and we talked some more about fact meaning. And he actually drew it out on a napkin. And he taught me and, and reemphasized more and more that the, the facts are really not so important. What matters are the meanings that we attach to those facts, the narrative that we allow for our interpretation. And so I see something and I tell myself, oh, that's bad. That's, that should not be that way. There's no way they should do that. That's my focus. That's the meaning I make up. The emotional kick from the perspective that I have gets fueled more and more. And there's an old quote that says, seeing is believing. But that quote came from seeing is believing, but feeling is reality. And so a chemical kick comes from the narrative you allow yourself to have, the conversation you allow yourself to have. And once you see something and feel something, that becomes your reality. And the reality that we live in now can be fearful if we put certain meanings on what we see and stay with that meaning. But if I notice that I'm not feeling good, I'm feeling scared, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling worried, I can shift my focus or I can say to myself, what am I making up about this right now? What am I making all this mean? And that's where you become powerful because now you get hit in the face with some water instead of going, man, I shouldn't have gotten hit with that water. You go, well, wait a minute, what can I tell myself about that water that maybe keeps me from being so angry and ticked off? Well, that water, maybe it helped me to cool down a little bit. I live in the desert and it's hot. And man, I really appreciate that. That water woke me up. Wow, that water gave me a little bit of a, a jolt and I needed that. Whatever that is, instead of going, that shouldn't have happened, and you tell yourself that, now this emotional cocktail gets kicked in. And emotions are simply chemicals. That's what you need to know. And so the idea of living in this, this, this situation we're in, right, and staying in it and telling ourselves it shouldn't be this way, there's gonna be certain chemicals that are fired off and that's their state of being and that's the reality we live in. And so when we get control of what we focus on, I think we get better control of our life. Uh, last little quote I always give people. When you master the moment, you master your life. And if you can learn to master the moments by where you put your focus or your attention, your life starts to line up with more of the things that you would say that you want. Sometimes it is way more difficult than others. Sometimes it's easy. You wake up and things just are working right. Then you wake up some days like this and something hits you from out of left field. You lose some money. Maybe your job, there's cutbacks. You lose a job. You lose a loved one. Uh, there's sickness. These things happen. This is life. But to think that it shouldn't be this way and to always try to control it and always try to force life through our funnel of what we think is right, that's where a lot of our frustration comes from, if not all of our frustration. Mm -hmm. You know, the old saying, you don't get disappointed by what you find. You only get disappointed by what you expected to find. And so if I expected my life to be easy, then when it's not and then I'm more frustrated, that's a problem. If I expected the economy to stay the same way that it's always been, that becomes my problem. If I expect my marriage to be like it was when we first started dating and we're still th act that same way, then that's going to be a problem because we all change. We all grow. And, you know, that, that's the one thing that I've learned about any of this. And I don't know, I'm talking too much. How long are we talking? How long? This is your, your, your thing today. <laughs> Mine. Yeah. Anything you want to add while I'm... No, I just, that reminds me of the conversation that you talk about flipping back and flipping forward oh, and yeah. focus and where if you are in a situation where you feel anxious or nervous or feel like you can't do something or can't go through something, you flip back to something that you have done before that you, you can explain this way better than I can. I'll butcher it up. you already done it. That's <laughs> go ahead. You don't know when you're when you're scared yeah. or... Okay, so... Uh, you face a situation that um, 
my friend Steve Murray gonna love this. Uh, you face a situation where you feel very anxious. I'll, I'll give you one for me. Like there have been, I've been invited in the last few years to go to some really amazing places and to walk into some boardrooms and coach some teams and work with teams on levels that maybe in the beginning I didn't, never expected to happen. And so uh, I've coached teams at American Express. I've done trainings at NASA. I've done our own seminars. I've walked in. I've been around the world, a lot of different countries. And there are times where I walk in where I am nervous. I'm scared to death. No kidding. Like people are like, man, do you still get nervous? It's like, absolutely, I still get nervous. I still get butterflies in my stomach. The, the key is to learn to get those butterflies to fly at least in some sort of formation, right? Because they're there. If you care, you're going to feel certain things. And so I've walked into rooms where I've been nervous, very nervous. I've had conference calls with teams where I've been very nervous. Um, but one of the things what Jennifer's talking about is called flipping back and flipping up. When you're facing something where you feel nervous or you're upset or you're afraid, you flip back to a time in your life where something worked really well or something went the way that you hoped it would go. And you flip, you take your mind back to that. Hey, Carol, you flip your mind back to that. You get all the emotional kick from how it felt when you did that and you made it happen when you knocked it out of the park. Right When you go back to that, like, man, I crushed it. And then you take that feeling, get your mind, use your imagination, pick up that feeling, bring it back to the present moment, and you operate from that moment in the present using a chemical kick, basically, some fuel from your mind because you used your imagination. And one of the, the equations that I learned from a guy named Mr. Tice many years ago, uh, and Steve Murray and I have talked about this many times, is he said, I times V equals R. And which meant your imagination times the vividness, how, how clear you can make it, equals your reality of what it is that you feel. So I times V equals R. I added a little to that recently that I times V plus A equals R, which is imagination. I imagine, I go back to the time, I imagine when I really created some success, when something went really well. I imagine that. I imagine it very vividly. I pull in as many details as I can because it's the details that cause you to feel something. Right, the specific details. You can close your mind and imagine something and imagine it in, in specific detail and it can cause you to feel all sorts of different things. You can imagine a time when you were, somebody said something negative about you and you think about that more and more and more in more vivid detail, the more frustrated you may get. Like your imagination, your frontal lobes, 60% 60, 60 of your brain is one of the biggest parts of your brain. Um, you, that vividness creates these chemical cocktails, which are your emotions. And so I times V is the vividness plus A equals R, plus the A is plus the action step that you will take from that, that vivid emotion. And I think that we are, we're emotionally driven people. We make decisions a lot of times not based on logic, but about how we feel. So I think it's very important for us to get control of how we feel by where we place our mind and bringing that back to present and center instead of being focused on all the things that are causing us uh, to be scared to death of word. Hi, Dawn Hayes. How are you? Um, thank you, Pat Patricia. Um, let's see. Anything else we need to add to this, or no, we... the um, wait. <laughs> He's so right. sweet. Um, the uh, action, what you add into there. I just had this thought of most of the time when, especially we go, we're going through something like this or a tragedy that we tend to freeze and get paralyzed mm -hmm. and don't know what to do, but the best way to get out of that and to move forward is to do something, is to take action on something. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Do you feel like that, would you agree? Um, yes, so there is a phrase that uh, action dissolves fear. And so mm -hmm. if you sit around and tell yourself you can't do something, you will justify and rationalize that story. Here's, here's how our brain works, right? I don't know if you guys get that I'm passionate about this. I love this stuff, right? I love this stuff. Some people ask me why. Why do you love this stuff so much? Well, I'm, I'm a very complex thinker. I have a lot of a very busy mind. My wife will tell you that, uh, very busy. And I read all the time because it helps me. I have seen a lot of pain. I have seen a lot of dysfunction. I have seen what happens when people uh, drug abuse. I've seen what happens when people are uh, emotionally abused. Uh, trainings and seminars that I've done, but just in real life. I have seen things. And um, for me, I, I, I have a very busy mind. And for, for me, what I do is I read, reading and learning. Um, there's a quote by Oliver Cromwell who said, he who stops being better stops being good. 
And so I'm always doing some work on being better. So I'm taking action on being better. But how our brain works is that whatever chemical cocktail is fired off in us, maybe because of what we ate the day before, right? Maybe because we're really tired from the day before and we're exhausted. Some of the, the goodies, some of the good chemicals that we need when we get plenty of rest, all these different things, those things can be depleted. And when they're depleted, we, we, we look at our world through a, a different type of a lens. And so your brain is always looking for pictures. Please remember that. Your brain always looks for pictures. This is why we go to the movies and we sit there and movies are moving pictures. That's why it's called movies, moving pictures. You can sit there in the movie and you watch these pictures go by so fast and you just get drawn in and the pictures elicit certain emotions. And this is why people like to go check out watching a movie. Well, when you don't have a movie in front of you, you're creating your own movie in your mind. And when you create your own movie in your mind because of something you might feel. So if I feel shame or guilt or resentment or jealousy or any of, of those things, if I have that feeling going on inside, I'll create a picture and I'll start searching out a justification or a rationalization of what it is that I have decided to feel and now I look for a picture to align with it. Now you might be wondering, well, why would you do that? So imagine that we're watching a movie. Let's say that Jen and I go out and we're watching a movie and the theater's packed and, people, hey Steve Turpin, hey buddy. Um, and imagine we're, we're in, in a movie theater and everybody in the movie theater is, is really upset and, and they're crying because they're watching a very sad part of a movie that's very moving. And then I look over at Jen and Jen's sitting there just killing herself laughing. Like, ha, 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 oh, 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 which that's how she laughs. I don't know if you guys know you, that or not. She keep going with that's that. It, but, oh, oh, this is, she throws her popcorn and her, her Coke. She doesn't even drink Coke, but oh, and everybody else is crying. <laughs> People would look at her and be like, what is wrong with that woman, right? Like she's, why? <laughs> because her experience is not meeting the experience of pretty much everybody else. And so what we tend to do is that we, whatever we have going on inside, we find pictures to align with that. And the reason we do it is so that we don't feel like we are crazy, you're looking for a picture to go with whatever the chemical is. And so uh, my, my friend Steve, I keep mentioning Steve, gosh, just Steve Murray. Uh, I just can't even say how much I love Steve Murray. I mean, one of my closest friends, mentors, he teaches me so much. One of the kindest, selfless people on the planet. Uh, he's at Real Life Church in Maple Valley, Washington. Um, they are there. Uh, but we've talked so much about this and the idea of finding pictures. And you find pictures that that align with the feeling so you don't feel like you've lost your mind and sometimes we do something called awfulizing and awfulizing is where you immediately go to worst case scenario when you feel something so i feel something like oh i'm a little bit fearful you don't even know why you're fearful you haven't figured that out yet but you're just laying in the bed maybe at night and you're a little bit anxious or something and you start looking for pictures in your mind you're running these movies going well if i don't return that email this is what's going to happen. If that done email didn't get back and that happens, then this is going to happen. I'm going to lose all these clients and then I'm going to lose all these clients. And the next thing you know, oh my gosh, this is what's going to be to happen from one email. And that's called awfulizing. And we're really good at doing that. And so, so the, the, the picture part of it is huge, awfulizing. So we go from awfulizing, as my friend Steve says, to hopefulizing is, is picturing a better, a, a better outcome. So how do we change the picture from bad to something good. Uh, very easy. Um, let's say, Gail, I were to tell you, don't think about a six-foot purple bunny rabbit standing in the corner of your room. Don't think about a six-foot bunny rabbit standing in the corner of your room. What's going to happen? You go, I'm not thinking about a six-foot six foot, six foot bunny rabbit. Yeah, well, purple standing in the corner. That's what that would look like. Immediately, you went somewhere. Even when somebody says, remember when you're a kid and your parents say, hey, don't cross the street? And you didn't really care about crossing the street up until your parents said, don't cross the street. Now you're like, I gotta cross that street. I gotta find out what's on the other side of that street. What goes in changes us so much that the way we move from bad to good 
is to start searching for pictures that we would say are good, that give us the chemical kick that we need, and use that as a frame of reference to go back to again and again. When people talk about meditating, I want to hear you. On, I want to tell you something about this, uh, Gail. Meditation simply means to make something familiar, and so people meditate on a Bible scripture. People meditate on on quotes that they've received from people that they would say are influential. Uh, they meditate on words that have been spoken into their life. You know, my dad told me that I, I was I was really smart and that I could do this and. You know, and, and me being smart, I, I, I'm going to believe it because I believe my dad, my dad was what you meditate on that and you make it familiar. When you go and you pray and you speak something, people do positive affirmations. I don't think prayer needs to be begging. We're not going to have the religious talk today. We're not. I don't think prayer is begging. I think the more you act like you don't have something and the more you speak of not having it, I think the more that's what you get. But I think when you affirm yourself positively, say, I am grateful to have this. I am grateful to get the new job. I am grateful that everything's working out. Um, the, you know, that's more positive. Um, that's the picture you hold as you meditate on it. It makes that familiar to you. And that becomes more of your reality. It's what you've made familiar. And so if I'm feeling something and I go, you know what? That's just, I mean, you become really powerful when you go, emotion. I'm feeling an emotion right now. Oh, that's just an emotion. Oh, that's fear. High fear, that's anger. Hey, anger, right? That's guilt or shame. Oh, hey, guilt or shame. Hey, how you doing? That's just a chemical. <laughs> I got you. You're not going to get me. I got you. I know what's going on right now. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to pull this trick on me. And the, the thing is, is that, uh, as my friend Steve just put on here, we move towards our most dominant picture. And so if I'm, I'm thinking, uh, my friend Jeff is a race car driver. We've talked about before that if, uh, in racing the car around the track, if you're in a spin out, you don't want to look at the wall and focus on the wall because you start to pull towards the wall. And I think a lot of times that's what we do is we create this worst case scenario and we hold it in our mind. And the reason we do that, guys, is check this out. The reason we do it is because we think in some way it's going to keep us safe. And so if I can project out there what it's going to look like when somebody jumps out from behind, you know, the corner or, or you know, like here in the desert, we were talking about snakes. We're getting all these notifications that, hey, be, be cautious. There could be snakes out. The weather's changing. Like I'm always thinking about, oh, my gosh, snakes, snakes, snakes. And that's what I allow my, 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 the, my mind to go to. I'm going to have that chemical emotion of fear all the time. And that can be helpful in some small ways. But if you stay in a place of fear your brain, you start to kick off from stress, cortisol, that starts impacting your heart, you start to develop heart disease, all based on the pictures that you hold. And so we have, I think we can do better, and I'm gonna stop talking, I've got, my, Jen is giving me the look of. No, I'm not. not. Yeah, you are, I know that picture. I'm just kidding. But you've got to be very clear of what pictures that you hold because you're gonna to go towards more of that dominant thought. And so if, here's, we'll bring this into very, very, I think applicable. If you're sitting around saying, hey, I can't go to this place because of this. Like, I, I could never make it in that arena. I could never write a book. I could never start a new career. Uh, I can never get fit. I, I can never be financially independent. I can never have a really amazing, passionate relationship with whatever. If you sit around telling yourself that, then you're gonna have the picture over time, more consistently, more dominant, that you can't do that. And so you don't feel like you've completely lost your mind, you're gonna look for pictures to justify that thought and ultimately produce results in alignment with the thought. So the results that you produce have so much to do with how you feel and how you behave, which starts with where you put your focus and how you think. And so this is why over the years you got people saying, man, the power of positive thinking. Well, positive thinking doesn't work. Well, it may not work, but it can help you to do work. And when you do work, you start to change your outcomes. And the problem with many of us is, is that we want to change our outcomes. We want to be better physically fit. We want to make more money. We want to have a little more freedom. We want to be able to take care of our families. Uh, we want to feel better. But a lot of times we won't do the work. And it starts with where you put your focus. 
If, if some people are like, well, I just don't have time to exercise. And I say, that is such bull. You do have time. You can wake up five minutes earlier and spend five minutes doing push-ups or sit-ups or jump jacks. Start with five minutes. The next day, do another five minutes. The next day, do seven minutes. Then do 10. And the next thing you know, you've built up some momentum. Now you see yourself behaving a way you weren't behaving before. And because pictures run your life and give you a chemical kick, kick seeing is believing. So I see myself behaving a certain way. I critique it in my mind because that's what I do. And I go, well, maybe I am the person that could exercise and find time. Maybe that is who I am. So I get up the next day. Maybe I can find time. Well, where could it be? Well, it could be right after lunch. Let me go do that or attack it immediately. And you start building momentum towards the things that you want. And momentum is what's called the great exaggerator. If you've got momentum and you're making good things happen, People will look at you and go, that person's got it figured out. I mean, they, they built up some momentum in their life. This is why the COVID thing is, is, is kind of detrimental because many people had some momentum and then this came from left field, took the wind out from behind their sails. But guess what? We can reset our sails today, even with the challenging and it challenges and even with the winds that are going left to right, we, we can make an adjustment. You might not be able to change the winds, but you can set your sails differently so you don't crash into the rocks again and again. You may crash into the rocks once, but you can say, hey, you know what? I hit the rocks once, and now I'm going to set my sail differently, and I'm going to go in a different direction. And, 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 you know, and right now, here's, here's one of the things that I think we got to address, and that is everybody's like, well, we're all in the same boat right now. That is not true. I was thinking about this yesterday, and I thought about doing a video on this yesterday, I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. My wife and I moved here six months ago. It took work. It took, we were afraid, moving out west, we were moving our family, packed everything up. We moved to a place we, we sight unseen. Like, it was a little scary, but I knew that our girls, our daughters, Addison, who's 10, Kennedy, who's six, who you just saw, I knew they'd love the swimming pool. I knew they'd love the, the weather. We moved out here. And so for us being in, in shelter in place, the girls are in and out of the swimming pool every day and they're loving it, which is really cool. But I also understand when we say things like we're all in the same boat, well, some people don't have a swimming pool. Some people are, 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 are alone right now. Some people are living in their house because they're elderly or they have an underlying health condition. They can't go out and play and do. And so we're not all in the same boat. And so being grateful for where you are in the boat that you're in, regardless of how it looks, and adjusting your sails accordingly is all any of us can do. Sometimes you feel like you're on the good side of it. Sometimes you can feel like you're on the bad side of it. But either way, if we'll continually adjust our sails, we can move forward towards a desired outcome. Otherwise, we stop adjusting our sails, and when the wind changes, it slams us into something. And we, look, sometimes you get slammed into things and it's the best thing that could have ever happened to you. You walk through a difficult time, you reassess yourself, you start to, to explore your thinking, you explore your belief systems. And let me tell you, sometimes when you search, you're gonna get hurt. Like if you search your belief systems and go, how has this served me in the past or not served me? Is this something that I believe that's not true? Have I adopted a false truth about myself? When you search, it hurts, but you, it's the old saying, you might get wounded, but it's probably not a fatal wound. It's not going to kill you, but it may suck for a while. And when you search deep within yourself going, hey, what can I be accountable to? What can I be responsible for? Um, I think that's the only way to create some change and move out of a storm. And I think that right now we, we would say we're probably in a storm. You keep adjusting your sails. People that I coach and people that I work with... Um, it's interesting. Sometimes it takes a whole 30-minute conversation every couple of weeks to talk to them and get their head back right. Sometimes it takes 10 minutes. I've had people where I hit them with something and they're like, that's what I needed to know. And I'm like, awesome, that's it. And they're like, yep, I got to go. And they go and they start taking action on the thought. And that's powerful. That's adjusting your sales every day. And we don't have to be set in how we do things. We can make adjustments. And so we're not saved by what we know. We're saved by what we're willing to learn from what we don't know, and we don't know how the future is going to be. We don't, but we can learn from the things that we're seeing and make sure we're creating meanings that serve us so that we feel good, so we take good action, and then hopefully we produce 
relationships that are good, we produce uh, uh, outcomes with our, our occupation or whatever it is that are, are more positive for us. With our children, the relationships are more positive, uh, our family more positive. Um, it starts with us and how we think. And so uh, this has been a long day. It's been a long day already. It's earlier for us. What time is it? Um, we've been nine, on for yeah, almost maybe. for an hour. So but, yeah, I um just wanted to add a couple of things, uh, and I hope I don't lose track. But the part of trying to figure out ourselves and like what what we have focused on or choose to focus on from our past, like we say, playing investigator, and I think that that's important for us to do especially right now because we have no other choice but to take a good hard look at where we are mentally, emotionally, and you're right, not we're not all in the same boat. We're all in this together and we're all trying to deal with it our own kind of way, but it's not equal in some senses, which which it, it that that really sucks, but um and it never it, is though. We're never no, in the oh, same. Not no, anything really. No, we're not. Um this is just magnified. Yeah, there's but, some people who you would say their boat is way way nicer than ours, right? Mm -hmm. Some people would say that their boat might not be as nice. It's like the guys that buy the yacht, and they're like, I felt good about my yacht until I pulled it up in, that guy's yacht. in Morocco and in and, and Monaco and just sitting in the harbor there, and there's, you know, I'm, I have a 50-foot, 70-foot yacht, and the guy pulls up in a 400-foot yacht. You know, that's life. Like, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a boat. There's some. So we're not in the same boat, but we are, I think, floating in the same ocean, we, you know, yeah. when the, the waves are going in different direction, but... Um, anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, uh, no. but the investigating okay. part, go but ahead. Yeah, and, and always investigating, and when, like, if there is a, a negative thought, you had said, well, my dad always said this about me, and so I'm going to believe that because my dad was this. I think that's very important to figure out what the source is and always go back to the source and decide for yourself, is that working for me? Has it worked for me in the past? Is it going to help me make better decisions? Is it going to help the future generations that I'm raising is what I believe about what somebody told me back in elementary school or when I was a kid or whatever. Is that going to help me raise my children the best way that they can be raised? And is that going to help me make the best decisions in my life and be the best that I can be? So playing investigator and always going back to the source, I think, is very important. Yeah. Going not, back not to just in this source as like what's going on in the immediate and what I'm choosing to focus on, but... That's where our programs and our belief systems and paradigms are really showing up now because some things just weren't handled back then, you know, yeah. or we, we have to continue and it's so hard. It's so uncomfortable. It, like it, it, it's like exercise. When you first start, you're like, oh. how can I even do this? I don't even know what I'm, I'm doing listening. and I, it's uncomfortable. Oh uh, yeah. I wrote yeah. that. Check this. This is so good. Did people tell you how pretty you were when you were little? Because you sure are. My anyway, mom did. here's what. Still on there. My mom, Mima's sure still did. on here. Mima still did. My dad yes. did. Yes. Um, my dad did. My dad and my mom. <laughs> um, you said something about They going, had to tell me that. Going back to. They had no other choice but to tell me. No, that's not true. Um, I, I meet people They're who. They're my parents. Yes, but not all parents are as awesome as your parents. I know. Um, so here's the. And I get all the benefits of good parenting. Think about that. How about that? Um, here's the. Um, Think about it. You said something about going back to the root of it. Mm -hmm. I wrote this quote down earlier, and uh, it's a quote by Jordan uh, Peterson. Uh, he said, We must take an axe to the tree that nourished us poorly with bad fruit. So, listen, we must take an axe to the tree that nourished us poorly with bad fruit. But then he goes on to say, Even if we are the ones that planted it ourselves. So maybe somebody sowed a seed into your mind when you were a kid and said, you know, uh, you are, you can't do this. You'll never be enough. Your fam everybody knows your family was this way or everybody like me is like, well, the DOS guys, everybody knows the DOS guys are like that. Or you know see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like that can happen. Those seeds get, you know, planted maybe by someone. However, sometimes in our life, like we grow this tree and that we eat the fruit of it, so to speak, and we're the ones that planted it, we're the ones that nourish it, which is ultimately we defend it. Like you have some negative thought and you defend it, like I could never do that because the negativity keeps you safe because you know if you keep talking negatively about yourself, it'll give you permission to not have to do anything new. So I keep telling myself that I'm, 
I'm not capable of that. I don't have the education to do that. There's no way I could do that. I couldn't be that person. And so you nourish that tree mm -hmm. and you keep eating the fruit of it. And what the quote, the thing that quote is so good, is you must take the ax to it and ultimately cut that down and even dig it up at the root. I mean, Jesus, when I think Jesus' deal was, Jesus said, cut it off at the root. Mm -hmm. I mean, go back to whatever the start of it is. If you can think back to where and when did I create this story about myself? Where did I create that? Where did it start? Well, back when, you know, I was playing t-ball when I was a kid and I struck out. And you can't strike out in t-ball, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but I struck out. And I told myself I should never get up to bat again and I should quit playing and being... That was pretty funny. Strike out in t-ball? Yeah. And Why are you looking at my teeth? Do I have something in my teeth? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> my hair. Don't do that, man. Don't do that. You've been, That's killing me here. You've been. Anyway, but so that so taking an axe to the tree that you've been eating the fruit mm -hmm. from it. So think of let's let's come up with um, analogies for that or, or examples of that. Um, I went through something as a kid and I uh, was abused. I could have gone through something uh, sexual abuse. I could have verbal abuse. Uh, I did something that maybe I shouldn't have done. I made what would be called a mistake. And then someone used that against me then, and they said I was a bad kid or a bad person, or, or this happens to us in adulthood. I go and I'm on my job, and, and the, the, Kevin Kaufman said, it's okay if you struck out in T-ball, bro. Thanks, man. That's why we're friends. That's Kevin Kaufman, one of the, I, I call I him the great Tell Zoe and Sophie we said hi. Also, he he lives not watch. too far from here. That's been my friend. Guys, Kevin Kaufman, I've been friends for over a decade. Um, one of the greatest dudes ever love you too man um but let's say you you get you tell yourself something or someone tells you you can't do something or that you're bad or whatever that plant sets seed and you keep sowing uh you've sown the seed someone's sown the seed and you keep watering it keep watering it now you feel shame or you feel guilt and there's a book I, i'll give you guys a book you want to read this book it is a heavy read book but it is called Power Versus Force by Dr. David Hawkins, and it's all about kinesiology testing and how you, your body becomes stronger when you think certain thoughts, like you physically get stronger, and how your body gets stronger if you put vitamin C tablet like on your tongue instantly, your body gets stronger. How if you start thinking thoughts of guilt or shame, your body immediately gets weaker. And so people use shame and guilt to control people. Like that's huge. Some people in religious organizations, like you're so, you're gonna go to hell and you're terrible. And that's used to control people. But if you come back and you act the way we want you to act, then you're good. Some really deep dogmatic religious organizations do that. Um, I speak in a lot of churches, as you guys know, and I can tell you I speak in churches because I know the pastors who are speaking life and encouragement and love and helping us to navigate the human condition. Those are the guys that I am friends with and that when I go to speak at a church, those are the guys that I'm, we're talking leadership, we're talking life, we're not condemning people, we're not telling people how bad or stupid they are because who are we to say that? At least that's my deal. I don't tell people that. Power versus Force, Dr. David Hawkins. Inside it, there's actually, if you open that book, inside there's a list, there's a table of emotions that we feel on a scale of how they cause us to respond. Like shame and guilt are some of the lowest levels of vibration of energy that we have. Um, so when people feel guilt or shame for something they did, they feel weak. And so if I went through something as a child or as a young adult or in a relationship and somebody really shamed me, like, you're stupid, I can't believe you, whatever, and they keep doing that, makes me weaker, then guess what happens? Easy to control me. Why? Because I'm weak. Maybe not easy to control me, but much easier to control someone whose energy's down, like, oh no, you know, I don't know if I can do this. You start having somebody who feels really empowered, confident, courageous, and is willing to make a commitment to something, you can't control that person. You can't stop a person that is committed. Like once somebody says, this is what I'm doing with my life, I'm gonna lead, I'm gonna take it on, I'm gonna set big goals and go for it. You can't stop that person. You can't stop them. And so if you're listening to this, I'm telling you, you can't be stopped once you decide that you're gonna focus on things that cause you to feel empowered and feel good about yourself, regardless of what your story may be like, my parents raised me this way. We didn't have enough education. We didn't have any money. We didn't whatever. Like my thing for me, the fact meaning, 
When I went to NASA and pulled that off and got invited back again, now when I think if I need some courage before I step on a platform, I think of the NASA symbol. <laughs> I do. I think about what it was like to go down there. That's one of them. I can think of the American Express times I've worked with, other companies I've worked with. It's like I can think that. It gives me power in that moment. I step into onto the platform and I deliver from a grounded and centered place because I put my mind on a thought that caused me to be more courageous. And that is practice. Like that's not natural. It, it's not a natural thing, but through repetition and practice of focusing on good stuff, you start to feel more confident and courageous. And then you start taking action. You pick up the phone. Some people don't want to prospect in their business because they're afraid of hearing no. Well, it's like, well, think about a time when you did prospect and you closed a deal and you made some money and you felt good. What was that like? Okay, I'm thinking about that. Then pick up the phone and make the call. Make the call. Talk from a place of boldness and courage not from a place of shame and guilt and not enough. And this is the work. This is the work. It's not a task. There's a difference between a work and the work. A work is a job we go to. The work is checking our brain, how we're thinking, what we're focusing on, and how we're feeling, and the narrative we have going on at any moment while we're doing a work. So my attitude while I'm on the job is the work. Right? Some people go, I gotta go do the work. The work is not your job. The work is your mindset, your energy, your focus, your beingness while you do a job. Right? And this is where your power comes from. Mm -hmm. You can step into anything. You, you, you want to move? Move. Set a goal. Say, we're going to move. We're going to move a, a mile away. We're going to move 10 miles away. You know what? We're going to go for it. We're going to move another state. We've always wanted to do that. We're not getting any younger. We're going to give it a go. You can write a book. You know, there's a book called um, The War of Art, and the guys talked, he wrote the, the screenplay for Bagger Vance, and he said the hardest thing about writing a book is sitting your butt down and writing. It's not coming up with the content. The hardest part is sitting yourself down. Why am I talking loud? <laughs> Are you pro you're just projecting. You're I'm passionate. trying to reach through the screen and say, <laughs> hi, everybody. Reach through and give hugs, virtual hugs. It's virtual hugs, virtual hugs, elbows. What's up? That's so stupid. No, it's awesome. Stop touching your face. I can touch my face. <laughs> touch my face. You touch no, my face. Oh, it's so good though. I yeah, I, I I even it's just you can look at it as like um a, a big scenario. I'm not a big scenario because I don't really think it's like big or little scenarios. There's no way to measure anything. It could be something that someone said to you as a kid. It just stuck for some reason. It stuck. It no doesn't mean that something bad was going on at the time, but somebody said something to you as a kid or as a teenager and it stuck with you. Mm -hmm. And then, so you've used that to then find the pictures to go along with it because you felt a certain way. So you're finding the pictures to go along with it to justify how you're feeling. And then it can snowball. Yeah. yeah. It can snowball into something where you live a life of the guilt or the shame or feeling a certain way. You feel the energy. Steve had another question. Um, I love the questions, you guys. Steve Murray said, I feel the energy. <laughs> Feel the energy? You're welcome, buddy. <laughs> um, what? what did he said? I have to go back to it. When you feel stress, what do you find are great stress releases besides mind shifts? Mind sh um, for me, my things. I'm a big reader. Mm -hmm. um, I read all the time. And not, but here, let me tell you this too. You got to be careful with letting reading be your outlet because you can go into a book, into that imaginary world of the book. And I don't read like, I don't read story form books. She enjoys that. When she reads, she likes story form stuff. I like reading more of insight. I like psychology. I like stuff on learning how the brain works. But you got to be careful with that because some people are like, well, I read three or four hours a day. And I'm like, you read three or four hours a day? Like, that's cool. But, like, do you have that kind of time? Because I, I don't. And But you might now. I, you might right, right now. now. Um, but you know, like that, but then it would be like, well, I'm reading, but then it would be the same as like, well, I'm watching a movie for three hours a day or Netflix for three hours a day. You got to look at that and be like, is this really good or healthy? And this is, is this helping me build for a better tomorrow? So you got to find that balance in there. It's the old saying, you know, people are like, I'm looking for balance. I got to find balance. You don't find balance. Balance is created. So you got to have enough of a self critique and assessment of yourself as you go through the days to say, uh, all right, is this a good balance? Right now, being home, shelter in place, all that stuff, you're probably not gonna have maybe as, as solid balance, but you have an opportunity to structure and figure it out. 
Because once, like what we talked about, once the floodgates are open and we get to go out again, a lot of these things that we found to be very important for us may get thrown out the window. Like, oh yeah, I learned that reading was good for me, but now I'm so busy driving back and forth across town because I'm not managing my time like I used to, and it's game on. Then what happens is those go out the window. So mm -hmm. for me, reading helps a ton. What I'm reading, like, you, I, I mean, I can show you right here. Like, this is my journal book. I think Dawn Hayes sent me these journals. But guys, I do... Just so you know, like I take notes all day. If you can see this, all day I'm writing. I got so many journals, and this is for me. I write. This it's is a bragging. discipline. Uh, it's not bragging. I'm you ask. Kidding. I'm just I being know. honest. It ain't bragging if you're honest. I'm just kidding. If it's true, isn't that what they say? Yeah. It's not anyway. But so I read a lot and write a ton. And um, then another thing, Jen and I, we we spend. We're stressed. Uh, we do date nights a lot. Um, which is we spend time together, we're talking, we make sure that we schedule a date night. Like uh, if we say, hey, is it Thursday night? That means that that's night we got a babysitter coming over and we go out and, and uh, yes, Dawn, I will text me, I will give you my address. The journals you sent me are almost full, sister. Um, see, all the way through. And there I am bragging again. But uh, we do date nights to where we can spend time together and, and we, you know, getting the girls in bed, we spend time. Bart Walker, it's not bragging if you can back it up. Bart Walker, bass player. Can I say this, can, Bart? Can, can I tell him who you are? A little bit. Can I tell you who Bart Walker? Bart Walker. Can I say who you are? Because you are the. He gave us a thumbs up. Somebody gave the. Somebody thumbs gave up. a thumbs up. Bart. Can but, I tell yeah. Bart who Bart is? Anyway, um, Bart Walker is, is one of the cool most story. incredible people on the whole planet. He's the bass player for Hank Williams Jr. and. Um, he came over and he he played the guitar for Kennedy at her birthday. <laughs> this guy's like the greatest guitar player ever. Lead guitar boy. Oh, sorry, my bad. He said lead guitar. My lead bad. Guitar. Boy. He comes over for Kennedy's birthday a couple years ago. Again, I don't but know she if you... Loved, she loved Bart. Oh. She was like, I want to hear Bart's song. I want to hear Bart. Song. That's what she said. I want to hear Bart's song. Okay, we got to get back to the thing. But it's But awesome it's such story. a good story. But anyway, he comes over. It's her birthday. He brings his guitar. He's going to do the happy birthday song for her and sing it with his guitar. And she starts screaming like, like someone <laughs> has hurt her really bad when Bart starts <laughs> playing with his guitar. And anyway, it's the ongoing joke. It's like, well, if you, you know, if you can impress Kennedy, then, then you can play for. And now even Kevin that's on here knows that at birthdays, she doesn't want you to sing happy oh, she birthday doesn't. to her. Kevin Coffin was at our house the other day. He, she didn't want, he, for her birthday. she doesn't want you to sing the happy She's birthday like, nope. song. So Bart, of course, again, we've had this conversation. He doesn't feel bad, but Bart invited me. I went and saw Kid Rock and uh, Hank Williams Jr. in Atlanta with him. And when you, see, when you see someone who has a humble spirit and will work their butt off to create a goal or a dream that they have, and you see them succeed, I saw Bart Walker standing up there just crushing the guitar next to Hank Williams Jr. And that no one deserves to be up there playing on that level. Uh, like him and he's so humble and so kind and he works it he works it and the, you know it success is never by accident that's an, a story and Bart will tell you he's like hey the, he wasn't born that talented it was work hours put in and uh, anyway the dude but is Bart, amazing is it okay if we tell the backstory at like just conversation that you've had before yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, your daughter needs okay. you real quick so yeah Bart and I just had how a conversation how he got there yeah so he's Let's let's move on with this. No, we're not making this about Bart. Bart, awesome. It's good to see you. Um, but overall, guys, here's what I, I think the 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 look on this whole deal is. Um, we have an opportunity, even in the midst of all the challenges and all the the setbacks, that um, we have a chance to restructure and reprioritize and reset our life. And I hope that's what you guys are willing to do here is that if you notice something during this time of sheltering in place or uh, the over this whole pandemic deal or whatever it is, if you notice something and you develop some awareness in the midst of it, write those things down that you learn and hold yourself accountable to whatever it is that you agree to. And if you will do that over time, you will navigate out of this situation. And as you come out of it, here's what I believe, I think you'll be better, I think you'll be wiser, I think you'll be stronger, and I think the results that you will produce in the future will be better than what you have produced, what you have before. And that means that you can look back on this time and say, hey, yeah, that, that was tough. 
that was really tough, but I'm going to use this time that I remember and I'm going to look for the silver lining in that cloud and I'm going to do something with it that makes me better, makes my family better, makes my existence, my future better. Um, it's the old quote. It says that not every day is great, but there's something great in every day. And I think that's what we need to stand on and what we need to uh, remember. And so, um, yeah. Let me tell you, want me to tell them about Bart really quick? Oh, yeah. You know I just thought it was. Out. Let, me, let me tell you, Bart, oh, know, Bart went and auditioned for Hank Williams Jr. And Hank Williams was who he, he learned so much of his music, playing his music. And so when he goes, I think uh, Bart, the, the guy that was doing the audition for, for him that day, came and asked Bart about um, uh, what song from the playlist. He, gives him, he showed him a playlist, and he says, which one of these do you feel comfortable playing? And well, Bart had grown up and used Hank Williams' music to, to get better and, and to be great, and he loved that music. And Bart, I think what Bart had told me was it was pretty much like, yeah, we'll just, why don't we just take it, take it from the top? <laughs> and they start, and the guy was like, holy cow, that's the most awesome. So the, the point of that was is that through preparation and doing things well, even when no one's looking, even during a time like COVID-19, even during a time like this where we're sheltering in place, doing the work uh, in private on ourselves, doing the best that we can with what we have. Mm -hmm. You may not have everything, but you have something. Doing the work with that. Uh, in time, opportunities come and, and, and you're prepared. And I believe for you all listening, and, and we can be done today, this is uh, enough. I think they've, they've heard enough, um, unless you think there's more. Um, but There's always more. There's always more. <laughs> but it's the old saying that luck happens when preparation meets opportunity. I believe that when you do the work, when no one is looking, you will step out of this situation that you are in and in situations in the future. And I'm telling you, you will be prepared and you will knock it out of the park. The time to get ready and the time to be ready are never the same. They are never, ever the same. But people ask me sometimes, Ronnie, how long does it take you to get ready for a talk? And as you guys can see, I'm making the joke of journaling and reading all day, every day. My saying is, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Mm -hmm. And I think this is life. And if you are willing to stay ready, even in the midst of this, and go, you know what? This is my life. I'm going to do the best that I can. I may not have it all figured out. This kind of stinks. There's some things that have been taken from us that we don't have. But we can do the work again to build back to where we were before. Better. Yes, it may be different. But this is not stopping us. This is not gonna stop me. There is a dark world out there that we need to shine our light in. And if you will work to shine your light as bright as you possibly can, there will come a time where people will look to you and go, hey, because of your attitude, because of what you do, because of the impact that you made, my life is better. I didn't quit, right? I stayed with it. And that could be your kids. It could be your parents, it can be your friends, it could be your in-laws, it can be whoever that one day say, hey, thanks for what you did. Because of that, I didn't quit. And I think that's the opportunity that mm -hmm. all of us have here. So um, anything else you wanna throw into that yeah. before we go? Yeah, and I think, um, and I'm, I'm oh, just- Oh, I have something. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go. I, I think um, what you're saying goes back to us all being in this storm together. And I, I saw a, a, like a quote or something being passed around on social media about the storms looking different for each of us. Like you had said before, we're not mm -hmm. all really in the same equal boat. in the same boat um, as far as this goes. So I, I just want to point out like being very careful when we're doing this on social media, obviously, but being very careful about spending too much time on social media and that causing uh, turmoil on the inside because likely mm -hmm. that's, that's what happens a lot of times. But now especially being on social media and seeing somebody post something that isn't in agreement with how you think things should be going right now, say what the president's doing, the decisions they're making or whatever, we can look at what people are posting at the moment and go, oh, they shouldn't say that. But you also have to keep in mind, they're in a completely different storm than you. Like they're stressed, most likely, right. they don't know what is going on, what's gonna happen to their, maybe even their home or their job right. or whatever. So I think we have to, just take a big step back and go, I don't think that they would have said that or posted that if this had not been going on because a lot of people are really stressed right now. Yeah. And I think it's easy for us to judge that person for saying or posting or whatever, but 
Right now is not the time to do anything but shine a light and be like, you know what, because you put positivity out there in the world, I was able to keep going and put one foot in front of the other. And that's like what I, that's, that's the challenge I have for people is to just keep putting the positivity out there and loving on people through this crazy crap that nobody thought that we would ever have to deal with. Yeah, and, you know? and, and, and here is my thought. It's not just right now. Right. It's always it's this just way. magnified at the moment. It's, it's magnified at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like this is, you know, everybody says, and, and I've, I've talked to a lot of the teams that I coach and work with, everybody's like, man, it's just one day at a time right now. We're just going one day at a time. Here's the truth. It's always been one day at a time. We just fooled ourselves into thinking that it wasn't. We just became so busy being busy that we overlooked the power of the present moment. And so that's the big thing we got to remember mm -hmm. is that it's always one day at a time. And so we get to ask ourselves this question. Is what I am saying benefiting my fellow man, woman, human being? Am I helping to lift them? My mentor used to tell me this. I've had a few mentors that would say this, but one of my mentors used to say, Ronnie, when you meet someone and they cross your path, very rarely do you leave them the same. You either take them up by encouraging them or you're going to take them down by your complacency, com casualness, or negativity. You can take them down. And so that is, that's the idea that we are all in the ocean together. we got different boats, so to speak, but we're in it together. Please remember that before you go on some rant telling somebody how stupid they are because of what they you know, do um, and what they know. Because most people operate from their level of understanding. Mm -hmm. And you operate. I operate. Take, make, take this home. Swallow this pill. You operate from your own understanding. And everybody thinks they're right in their own eyes. And, and that always... People think they're right in their own eyes. Even if they're deluding their own, own selves or, or in delusion themselves, they're delusional. Telling they're, they're right. I'm justifying my perspective. And the more I say what I feel, it fuels it more and there's emotion. And I'm not saying that, that everybody's opinions can't be valuable. But I don't think now is the time where you take shots at people going, man, you're so stupid. Because I'm watching some people going, that's pretty stupid. I don't think you should say that. I don't whatever. But then I'm like, who am I to judge? So I'm just going to try to encourage and infuse people with the idea that you got to watch your thinking. Don't let your old programming take over from how you felt way back then. Try to be as present as you can and look for the good in these situations and, and see if you don't feel better. See if you don't make better decisions from that. When you feel better, you do better. That's what I've learned. And, so it, and, and please hear me. Sometimes the best thing you can ever feel is not feeling good. When someone gives you feedback on something and goes, hey, maybe you didn't see this, you could probably work on that, sometimes it stings. But I would rather have an immediate hit that hurt that I could do something with than have a lingering dull pain my whole life because I never addressed or confronted my own thinking. That's how I choose to show up. It's like, give it to me, baby. Come on, lay it out. Come on, it might hurt, but you know what? Uh, it's Benjamin Franklin, I think, uh, that said, if it hurts, it instructs. And a lot of times we don't want to feel the pain. And so we become delusional and we look the other way and turn a blind eye. And what I always say is what you turn a blind eye to eventually becomes a blind spot. And blind spots are where accidents happen. And so in your own life, just be careful that you're not turning a blind eye to somebody else's perspective just because you don't want to change how you think. Like you don't really, I, I heard someone saying this is that you don't, aren't really thinking until you've taken an opposing view, brought it in, and looked at it from 360 all the way around and incorporated their perspective. And even if it's different than yours, you don't really even understand your own perspective until you've considered someone else's and looked at it. That requires thinking. And let me tell you something. Most people don't think that's what I've learned is people just do what they've been told. It becomes a, 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 like a subconscious, unconscious approach to life. And many times you don't think. I try. I try. I think my wife would tell you. She, she calls me the thinker sometimes. She'll look over at me. I'll be sitting in a chair. And I got this little squint. and this little. See these good looking wrinkles that I have in my head right here? See that right there? Don't do that. What are you doing? Anyway, <laughs> making fun of me. Look at that cut right there. How about that? But the, I sit around and I think, and she's like, you're thinking. And she calls me the thinking guy because that's what I do. I ponder thoughts because here's what's going to happen. Come Monday morning, this coming Monday morning, 
at 4.45 a.m. I will be on the phone and I will be coaching people that are producing and making things happen in their life. And so I have to be able to be present with them and offer them different perspectives on what's going on to help them make the best choices that they can. What are you doing? And so with that, like, <laughs> what are you doing? Karen said something about the clock. And I that just turned clock. around to look at it, and now it stopped. Oh, Karen, that's a clock that we would have on the wall, depending on where I sit. I can watch it count down. So if I'm doing a podcast or something, I can know how long I've been, especially with videos that I do. Oh, and that reminds me. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, what was I just talking about? You don't even know. You were distracted by the clock. Uh, write this down, everybody. Um, this is the free gift. Like, we're not selling you anything. Um, you can, if you want to be a part of what we do, you can look on my website and subscribe to some of our videos. But we are creating a program that is free. It's called Boost. So type in RonnieDoss.com forward slash Boost, B-O-O-S-T. And uh, we're just, we created a brand new video program, and those are free. So if you go to RonnieDoss.com forward slash Boost, B-O-O-S-T, and use promo code Boost, B-O-O-S-T. It will make the, the membership free and you get weekly videos from me talking about some of the things that I'm talking about right now that we're talking about and, uh, and I'm just helping you to think a little differently and stirring uh, your, your thought processes some. How many of you thumbs up would say that if you hear something or you listen to a podcast or you talk to somebody who's really encouraging that it helps you to get focused again and it helps you to take better action towards the things that you want. How many of you would say that, right? Yep. That's why we do what we do. And so we're doing it video form. So you, it's on Boost. It's on one platform. All our video memberships are, but this one is absolutely free. No bait and switch. You don't have to buy any other videos. You don't need to download my books. Or Actually, it comes with a free downloaded book. Yep. You don't need to do all that. This is totally a gift for you. This is me doing what I do and going, hey, this can help. And so it's called Boost. RonnieDoss.com forward slash Boost. Boost is the promo code. I think it's all caps, B-O-O-S-T. It'll make it free. It will be free when you put in the promo code, and you can watch these videos every week. They're coming out. You can watch them from your phone, tablet, laptop, whatever. And also my podcast, uh, Ronnie Doss, just go to your, you can hit the button. Do you have your phone in here or my phone? If you hit the button on your iPhone, which if you have an iPhone, hit the podcast, the purple button, and just type in Ronnie Doss, you'll hear all, you'll see all these episodes of my podcast, and our, the listeners and the views what would you call it? The downloads are going up so much, and that's awesome. Um, but those are the gift. RonnieDoss.com forward slash boost. Emerge is the podcast name. And then the, the well, yeah. name of But the... just type in Ronnie Doss on the podcast or go to iTunes and type in Ronnie Doss. And you get plenty of me. You're, she's on some of them with me, which is amazing. Like one, right? One or two? I said some. Some. Some counts. One counts as um, some. Um, I'm drawing a heart. But no, this, the, we did the... It's a heart. <laughs> We, we wanted to create Boost because of what all is going on right now because that is where we knew we had a gift to give the world. It's a resource that we have already that we knew that we could go ahead and put out there because of what people are struggling with and dealing with. So that's another thing I think is for us to think about while we're going through this and we're all dealing with it ourselves, but what can we give to the world? What gifts do you have that you could give to the world? And it, it may be nothing more than just putting something nice out on social media or whatever, but what can you do? Like I see people sewing masks and giving them away just because they're like, I know we, it's a need. They create um, a solution and they give it out. What kind of solution can we be? So this is why we did Boost is to be a solution to helping people deal with some of the things that come up in their mind and in their brain and their emotions right now. Yeah, I we had our neighbor brought over and dropped off at our front door some toilet paper. Like that was pretty like, cool. That's, it's just so cool. Like we... Um, toilet paper those things, nothing but like, it's something it's nothing it's, but it's, I mean, obviously it's a lot it's right the, now <laughs> it's obviously the most important resource on the face of the planet <laughs> paper towels <laughs> anyway um, but <sighs> doing those things those little small things like that so we decided to do boost for that so that's why yeah. I mentioned it. that's a gift and also if you want to put it in if you wanted to, to share this but you could do ronnydoss.com forward slash uh, boost and then tell people in your social networks to go to it. They can subscribe. You're just giving them free stuff. It is absolutely free. There's no bait and switch. I hate the bait and switch. We're going to give you this, but we're going to try to sell you this. And it's I, so somebody easy. Somebody should have sold me this haircut. Oh, my God. Oh my God. It looks good, You're the good, one that though. keeps making fun of it, not I know. me. No, I, I like it. I may start it's doing good. my hair all the time. I don't think it's you good. can handle it, though. Because I'm, so, I'm so good. What would we call your salon if you started one? What's the name of your hair salon if you wanted to? Big Ron's Cut and Shape. 
Anybody have any suggestions? <laughs> what, what would you call my barbershop? How about that? Let's do that. I don't know where this is going. Oh, should we just my. end this? Do you guys think we should just turn this off? If so, this it's is going, going from leadership and so forth. But let me tell you, one of the things that I have learned is that if you can't have fun, uh, wow. Like laughter does uh, good like a medicine, right? That's the actual biblical scripture. Uh, Steve Murray Steve. said it's the worst haircut Tina I've ever Tina just called seen. you out earlier. I saw her having a fro. Oh, Steve says the worst haircut he's ever seen. That is not true. I had a friend of mine one time, I got a haircut, and they said, did you get your haircut? And I said, yeah, and they, could, they said, let me know if you want me to fix it. And I thought, that ain't yeah. cool. That is not cool. Uh, any last thing before we end this? Um, thank you for being here and doing this. Hey, thank you guys so much for being on here, I guess. I'm mean, thanking you. My mentor used to say, hey, don't thank people for coming to your events. He goes, no. uh, they should be thanking you because you're the one giving them that was kind of how I was, it was kind of interesting. Don't think. No, me, that's true. Because of what, not not just now, but anytime I think people that need help dealing with emotions or dealing with the way that they're thinking and perspectives, this is valuable. So share it. And I'm, I tell him all the time, don't be ashamed to ask people to share your Facebook lives or your the information so that you ashamed. put out there. That's why you do it is yeah. to help people. And I think. Yeah, I don't do the, I, we haven't, I have not, social media killed it in my career. And I spend so much time on the phone and video, Zoom, Hangout, Skype, uh, uh, FaceTime with people that I work with that the social media thing, it's so important, but there's so much on social media. There's so much noise. And that's one of the things that, that is a saying that I've shared many times, noise destroys. And if you allow anybody and everybody in, sometimes it can be difficult, you know, to stay focused when there's there's all this stuff happening. Um, be very careful of, of who you're allowing to speak into your life. And then another thing, uh, Bart Walker said, Dossie cuts. Wanna look Dossum? Dossie cuts. Uh, one of the things is you gotta be careful who you allow to speak into your life. You have to be careful who you allow, who you allow to describe you to you, which means you have to be careful how you even talk to you about you. And so social media is a watered down version of mass media a lot of times because people are only saying on social media what they hear from media. And so, well, this is what we know is true and they share their perspective, but they got their truth from their watching CNN or Fox or NMSNBC or whoever that they get or whatever that is, right? And so it's a watered down version. So you got to be very careful about who you allow to speak into your life. And so my hope is that you are reading good stuff. We got so many resources, uh, but we got so many videos. We have this. I hope that you'll keep checking these things out um, because we want to help you and so into your life. Our life, we feel very, very blessed. I have so many wonderful people that I get to work with and I feel very blessed. I wake up every day grateful for the people that, that believe in me enough to encourage them and to coach them and talk to them and their teams. Um, and I'm grateful for that, but we want to sow out, sow seeds into people's lives, uh, whether we coach them or they pay for stuff or not. So, uh, this is fun for us. This is what we do. This is our life. This is really where we live. We, we live in this place, um, all the time and it's an absolute, uh, honor and privilege to do it. So we feel very, very grateful and I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful Thanks for coming for you. on. Give me a kiss. <laughs> I'm uh, in my, my cut. Anyway. Does God, it, yes. I was just gonna say, does anybody have like any last question? Any, anything that you could be dealing with? And I also said at the beginning, if for some of the people that came on later, if you want an anonymous question answered, I have it opened up right here, our email at info at dosteam.com. So just in, email that info at dosteam.com if there's something anonymously you would like to have answered. It's right here, we're looking at it. And then we can see your questions here. So if there's anything else that you would like to know yeah so if there's anything else anybody but if not we done it's saturday everybody have a great saturday saturday you know. saturday what? i don't know what day, know. Is what, day? <laughs> what day is it saturday you know, saturday it's that's like, when you it used to be tgf you know tgf fridays tgf fridays yeah tgf fridays tgif doesn't have a whole lot of meaning right now Thank I mean, God you... it's, yep, uh, today. that's it. Thank, Thank God, God it's, it's, it's right now. Yep, it's today. And just so you guys know, if you 
schedule, if you subscribe to the Boost program, we're gonna give you a free, <laughs> a free haircut. A free fade. Of your own. Do that uh, look, we're happy to do it. Just take the, the trimmers out and we'll get the, I'm happy to, just so you know. It's more free stuff from Dossie Cuts. Thanks, Bart. Dossie Cuts. All right, well, awesome. this is it. We're gonna go hang with our, our children and our family, and uh, thank you guys for being awesome. Know that we love you, care about you, and we, we believe the best is still uh, to come. So um, stay at it. Don't quit. If you need anything, you can email us, info at dosteam.com, I-N-F-O at dosteam.com. So um, anyway. You yeah, so, uh, Peter just said that he's still working, and that's one thing that I wanted to also point out before we go. Thank you to all the people that are still working and keeping all of this going this whole just keeping whatever we can keep afloat there's that thank you to the first responders the medical workers i mean there's it like it's just endless the thank yous that we can put out there so that's one thing i wanted to say also is to share this and then share the boost program information with those people because i think they really need it most at this point you know people that have been separated from their families because of the virus or whatever, just that are on the forefront of all of this and the essential workers and people keeping this whole thing going. So yeah, this, and we, we're all keeping it going. I mean, everybody yeah. has their, but for sure, there are people mm -hmm. out there right now that are putting themselves on the front lines of dealing with people and we all do in our own way. That is, it doesn't matter from, you know, first responders to people working at a bank, people to, you know, that are picking up trash, Groceries people, grocery, I mean, all of it. I mean, like the thing that this has shown us is that we are all definitely, definitely connected. We are. And when one thing shuts down, it affects other things, but people are stepping up and showing their heart and being courageous and being and serving and making contribution. And that's the beautiful thing about us as human beings. I think we are resilient. And I think that we will figure it out and we will keep pushing and we will keep making good stuff happen. And uh, we're gonna do that. You can count on us to give our best to do that. So again, that's it. Peace out, Dossie Cuts, just so you know. All right, <laughs> God bless you guys. Out. We'll see you next time, bye. <laughs>